Dying and resurrecting God is one of the oldest ideas of mankind, widespread and exceptionally variant in its forms. It forms part of the set of presuppositions that underlie the most ancient shamanic rituals, carried over, perhaps, from the Stone Age itself. It is echoed in the foundational stories of ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece. It manifests itself in allegorical forms. In the figure of the phoenix, for example, which immolates itself, regains its youthful form, and rises in triumph from the ashes. It recurs repeatedly in the tropes of popular culture as well, bringing even those entirely devoid of religious education under the spell. Marvel's iconic Iron Man plummets like Icarus from sky to ground after saving the world from demonic, serpentine, otherworld forces, and then arises from his death. The child wizard Harry Potter must ultimately die and be reborn to defeat Voldemort, a very thinly disguised Satan. All of that creative variation on a theme speaks of a deep, ineradicable, and eternally re-emergent psychological reality. We all see this in our day-to-day -day lives, and we all know it because we see it. A small failure, a small disappointment, frustration, or disenchantment engenders within us a small death, a small descent into the underworld, a small requirement for rebirth. A large failure produces a proportionately large catastrophe and transformation. When you are compelled to talk to someone because you face divorce or the failure of a treasured ambition or the illness or death of someone close, you are walking yourself through the eternal narrative. Stability, crisis, death, transformation, rebirth. That's the story of our lives. That's the fall and the reestablishment of paradise. The idea that the Savior is the figure who dies and resurrects is a representation in dramatic or narrative form of the brute fact that psychological progress, indeed learning itself, requires continual death and rebirth of lesser and greater magnitude. If you are engaged in a serious interpersonal conflict or argument or facing a true crisis in your life, the new information confronting you cannot be incorporated without the oh-so-painful demise of your previous conceptions and all of the resistance comprehension of that pain necessarily entails. That's part and parcel of the process so famously described as assimilation and accommodation by the great developmental psychologist Jean Piaget. We each confront the world with a set of preconceptualizations whose function is simultaneously to delimit and render pragmatic our very perceptions, thoughts, and actions. In the absence of this a priori, we simply cannot function. Nonetheless, it is still insufficient. No one ever knows enough. And what we each do not yet know will, at some moment of crisis, become of vital importance. When something new and hydra-like confronts us and shakes us to our core, what is old and anachronistic within must therefore immolate itself and die. It is very rare indeed to learn something profound without suffering the terrible pain of dashed dreams and the soul-shaking terror of uncertainty and doubt. This means that none of us should identify in the most fundamental sense with what we currently know and presume means as well that we should all come to understand that so that we do not remain confused about who we are. This means that it is never sufficient to be conservative or to identify with the past or to become ideologically or dogmatically committed or to remain stubbornly anachronistic and unchanged. The environment transforms headlong around us and we all must run as fast as we can, as Ellis's Red Queen well knew, just to stay in the same place. It is not sufficient either to abandon tradition and structure entirely in a headlong and irresponsible rush towards the anomalous and revolutionary. Structure is insufficient, but it is still necessary, and the ethical requirement for respecting and maintaining it is still of paramount import. We each must as well similarly avoid falling prey to the temptation of identifying with the chaotic, 
depressing, anxiety-ridden, and nihilism-inducing state of affairs engendered by the terrible confrontation with the genuinely unknown. Even when thrust into the underworld by the dread events of our life, we must not characterize ourselves as permanent inhabitants of that dark and dread place, lest we lose hope, despair, and seek revenge. To progress psychologically, you must let go, sacrifice, time and again in the face of successive obstacles. You must abandon those things that, and often those people who, are impeding your progress, despite the fact that you may have held them very close to your heart. When you're wrong, when you've missed the mark, when you've sinned, because that is the meaning of sin, you must let the part of you that is wrong and aiming improperly die. Then you must allow the new spirit manifesting itself within to spring to life. That new spirit, that's the terrible information contained in whatever error you committed, in living conjunction with the now transformed structures you originally employed to frame the situation. That new spirit, it's a manifestation as well, and in other words, of the potential within you that had not yet been called forth by the previous travails of your life. Christ is, symbolically, the way and the truth of life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Embracing the process of voluntary death and rebirth that is identical with psychological development means determining to move forward and upward despite the horrors of life. It means as well, symbolically speaking, rejuvenating the dead father or rescuing him from stagnation and deterioration in the eternal underworld. Forthright individual confrontation with the unknown renews the individual but also catalyzes cultural revitalization. This is the essence of Christian ritual and belief, articulated as a psychological principle. We must identify with that part of ourselves that is always stretching beyond what we currently know and has the faith to let go of old certainties so that new patterns of being can be brought into place. It is through identification with the process symbolized by Easter that we are each redeemed and our culture revivified and salvaged. We are all the slaves of Pharisees and lawyers, of those who place dogma above spirit at the cost of spirit. We are all subject to betrayal by ourselves and by all those who surround us. We are all facing extinction in the most torturous of manners. But there is a spirit within us with sufficient courage to confront the true horrors of existence forthrightly, to allow the transformation, even death, that such confrontation catalyzes to occur and to leap forward renewed. How is it that life might prevail in the face of death and hell, with arms open embracing its fate? We are all fallen creatures and we all know it. We are all separated from what should be and thrown into the world of death and despair. We are all brutally crucified on the cross that is the reality of life itself. To rebel against that fate merely worsens it, transforming what could be mere tragedy into something indistinguishable from hell. To argue bitterly and despair around the deathbed of a loved one to take a single example, is to turn all the pain of death and loss into something far worse. To accept instead? Is that simultaneously to transcend? It's certainly courage and truth and perhaps even love, and these three forces are something to behold. Are they more powerful than despair and the desire for vengeance? That is the Christian suggestion. And the Christian command? To act out the proposition that courage and truth and love are more powerful than death and despair and to accept what transpires as a consequence. That is Easter and the death and resurrection of Christ. We forget or remain blind to such things at our great peril.